Hello, and welcome to our Grade 11 Life Sciences lesson, in which we are going to be looking at the human digestive system. First thing we need to know is that there are certain processes involved in the digestive process. Okay, first of all, you have to take food in, and that is called ingestion. Then, because food is quite large, usually an apple, something like that, you have to break it down, and the breakdown is called digestion, breaking it down into smaller pieces. Once the smaller pieces have been broken down, they have to then be absorbed into the blood so that they can go to different parts of the body. Then, once they're at the different part of the body, they need to go into the cells so that they can play a role in growth. And that is called assimilation. In other words, that is when the food that was on your plate actually becomes part of the cells in your body. Then there will always be some bits in the food we eat that our bodies can't digest. And those undigestible bits get passed out in the process of e Digestion. So we're going to look at the human digestive system, but bear in mind that as food moves along the digestive system, these processes are going to happen. Let's have a look at the two different types of digestion. Food has to be broken down so that we can absorb it and use it. And it's broken down firstly by physical or mechanical means. In other words, that's what happens when you chew something. The food is broken into smaller pieces. Then, once it's in our digestive system, it undergoes chemical digestion, which occurs by means of digestive enzymes. And these act on large molecules and break them up into smaller molecules, which our bodies then have the ability to use. So, which one of these has to happen first? Obviously, physical digestion, break it into small pieces, followed by chemical digestion, break down by means of enzymes. Now, mechanical digestion starts in your mouth. Chemical digestion also starts in your mouth, because your saliva has an enzyme in it. Once you have chewed your food, you have to swallow. So that's another process that has to happen during the process of digestion. And that's quite important because if you don't swallow correctly, you can actually die. Reason, if we have a look at this picture, that's the food that you have just eaten. And it's got to go down this part here, which is your esophagus. You don't want it to go down that part, because then you will choke. So, when you swallow, and if you put your hand here on your larynx, as you swallow, you will feel it moving. So the larynx moves up, and that little flap of cartilage called the epiglottis, luckily for us, covers the opening to the windpipe while you are swallowing. And quite honestly, if you're busy swallowing and you suddenly want to talk before you finish swallowing, very often you'll find that's when you choke because the food hasn't properly gone down into the esophagus yet. When it has, then you finish swallowing, then you can start talking and you won't choke. Another process that you need to know is the process called peristalsis. And peristalsis is what pushes the food along the digestive system. So let's have a look at the process. It's called peristalsis. And if that's 
a bundle of food or what is called a bolus of food, it gets pushed down along your digestive system, even if you're lying down. So this doesn't rely on gravity, it relies on muscles. And there are circular muscles, which you can see there, the muscles around the digestive system have contracted and they are pushing the food downwards. And the food will eventually be pushed all the way down into your stomach. So you don't have to think about it. Your body automatically will push the food along. Last time you remember what you ate was when you swallowed it and then it's gone and your digestive system takes care of it after that. So let's have a look at our digestive system, sometimes also called the alimentary canal. And that's basically a continuous tube from the mouth there where the food goes in to the other end there where the leftover bits go out. It takes quite a long time for the food to pass through this rather long tube. It's divided into several regions and that's one of the regions, you know, the stomach. That's another region, the small intestine. And as food moves along, food is broken down in a step-by-step -step manner. So the stomach will do a certain part of digestion. The small intestine will do another part of digestion. Then right at the end of the small intestine, when the food is digested, has been digested, it is absorbed. Then we also have accessory glands like the liver and the pancreas. Okay, there's the liver and the pancreas and they assist digestion. Please don't ever say that the food goes through the pancreas. It doesn't. The pancreas adds a juice to the food to help digestion. So what happens during digestion? Food is broken down first by chewing and then by enzymes. And you should know from your work you did, I can't remember when, um, on biological compounds that there are three different types of foods, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and the enzymes which break down carbohydrates are called carbohydrases. The enzymes which break down lipids are called lipases, and the enzymes which break down proteins are called proteases. And you should know that when carbohydrates are broken down, we end up with small molecules called glucose. When amino acids are broken down, sorry, when proteins are broken down, we end up with amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And when fats are broken down, we end up with fatty acids and glycerol, which are the end products of the digestion of fat. And these, only these, are what our body can absorb, which is why it has to be broken down. Okay, so let's have a look at what actually happens here. Food goes into the one end of the tube, it passes along the tube, and as it does so, it gets digested. So, first of all, mouth. Then you swallow it and it goes down the esophagus, spends a bit of time being churned in your stomach, then it gets to the small intestine, which is your main digestive organ. It spends 12 hours or so, sometimes even more, in the small intestine. Then it goes to the large intestine and eventually it will be passed out of the anus. The two accessory glands that are important are the liver, along with the little thing underneath it, which is the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And we're going to have a look at each one of these and see why are they important. So let's start in the mouth. 
chewing, which is mechanical digestion. Food is mixed with saliva. Those things there are salivary glands, which produce saliva all day, every day, especially when you can smell nice food. Then, as you chew, enzymes start starch digestion. So your chemical digestion actually starts in the mouth. Then if we look at this picture, this is a side view through the head. That's the mouth with the tongue. Food passes down during swallowing because this closes off the opening to the windpipe. Then how does it get down the esophagus? It gets down the esophagus by peristalsis. That happens quite quickly then goes into the stomach and it stays in the stomach sometimes for several hours. So what happens in the stomach? The food gets churned. The muscles, if we look at this picture, the muscles of the stomach are contracting. And as they contract, they're churning or mixing up what is in your stomach. And that is, of course, the nice sloppy food that you've just chewed. What does the churning do? It mixes the food with gastric juice. And in gastric juice is hydrochloric acid. And that is what actually causes heartburn. And that's why you take an um, donut. Antacid. Sorry. That's why you take an antacid when you have too much acid in your stomach. Then also, protein digestion by enzymes starts and food is stored. If you have a big meal, it sits in your stomach, gets churned and only gets passed out in very small amounts because your small intestine is actually only the size of your um, thumb. So it's actually quite small. It can't take a lot of food at once. That's why you have a stomach to help store food. I think we need a break now. Besides, isn't this making you hungry? Welcome back. I'm sure you went and had a snack while I was gone. Now, let's have a look and see, well, if you did have a snack, what is actually happening to the snack after you have eaten it? We talked about how it passes down the esophagus. So now let's follow on what is happening. Okay, first of all, here, it's come down the esophagus and it's gone into the stomach. It's been churned a little bit. Then once it's nicely churned and mixed with gastric juice, it goes into the small intestine. But it's at this particular point that two other organs come into play. And the one is the liver with the gallbladder tucked up underneath it that produces bile. It's an antiseptic liquid called bile. It's stored in the gallbladder, and when you eat food, the gallbladder will release it into the small intestine. And why? Because it emulsifies fats. It helps break down fats so that they can be properly digested. The other organ is just tucked up here underneath the stomach, and that is the pancreas, and it produces a liquid called pancreatic juice, which has enzymes to break down all food types. And both of these put their liquids into the small intestine or duodenum just after the food has left the stomach. Now, let's see exactly what is happening here. Okay, first of all, there was saliva in the food. It came down into the stomach the stomach had enzymes and acids, so a bit of digestion did occur. Then, once it's been nicely churned, it goes into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, and that is where the pancreatic juice 
comes out through this little hole and pancreatic juice has got enzymes to break down all food types and bile which came down was stored in the gallbladder now goes also into the small intestine so along with the intestinal juice which is produced by the small intestine we also have bile and pancreatic juice a lovely mixture for digestion let's have a look at the small intestine first of all it's very long seven meters to be exact and the reason it's long is the food's got to take time why must it take time because it's got to be properly broken down. One of the cures for obesity is they actually cut away part of your stomach and part of your intestine, which means you can't digest and absorb as much food. So it takes a while for the food to pass through, but that simply makes the digestion process very good. Then it also produces the intestinal juice and any intestinal juice is food or are enzymes to break down all types of food because your small intestine is your main digestive organ. You can see here this shows from the pancreas, chips, enzymes going into the small intestine food being broken down and then right at the end of the small intestine once the food has been broken down the food is absorbed so once the food has been digested it is absorbed goes into your blood because your food has to go to your cells because that's where the food is needed <clears throat> okay so if we have a look this emphasizes the breakdown all your fatty foods end up as fatty acids all your carbohydrates end up as glucose and all your proteins end up as different types of amino acids and only these are small enough to fit through the cell membranes of the wall surrounding the intestine anything bigger cannot be absorbed so in the small intestine, food substances are broken down and then absorbed. Now, how come the food is absorbed? Small intestine is specialized for the function of absorbing food. It's got a lining made of millions of little finger-like structures, microscopic they are to increase the surface area so that as much food as possible can be absorbed. Inside the villi are blood vessels. You can see them here in red and blue. And what's shown in brown here, okay, that is called a lacteal. And between the lacteal and the blood capillary, they absorb all the food that has been digested. Now, to make this digestive process easier, the epithelium, which is the lining of the intestine, is only a single layer thick, which means food can easily pass through it. So, let's have a look at how food is absorbed. So, we'll start off glucose and glucose is absorbed glucose as we know is a monosaccharide and that enters the blood vessels how does it go into the blood you should have learned before about diffusion which is movement from a high to a low concentration and because there's a very high concentration of food from the meal you've eaten and there's a lower concentration in the blood, it would move in by diffusion. But what do we know about diffusion? It stops when concentrations are equal. So the last little bit of food will need to be taken out of the small intestine 
by a process called active absorption, which is when energy is used to take those last little bits of food out of the intestine because you don't want any of it to pass out of your body because you need the food. Then in the blood, goes in the blood and the carbohydrates or the glucose goes to the liver. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit later about what the liver does. And it passes through a vessel called the hepatic portal vein. Fats, on the other hand, fats are not very soluble in water and blood is mainly water. So your body's got a different way and that is this thing in the center here which is called the lacteal. The fats will actually go into the lacteal. You can see there's pictures of them here. They are busy passing along the lacteal and they go through the lymphatic system, which you should have heard of before, and they then go straight into the blood. So they pass through the lymphatic system and into the blood near the heart. So your fat bypasses the liver. All the rest of your food goes off to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. And let's have a look at the steps. First of all, products of digestion get absorbed. They go into the blood. They then travel to the liver in this blood vessel, which is the hepatic portal vein. And the hepatic portal vein takes blood to the liver. It flows through capillaries and the liver checks the contents of what has been absorbed from your intestine. And what the liver will do, it basically does a quality control of what you have taken in. And we will later look at exactly how the liver does this quality control. So the liver will take out everything that shouldn't be in the blood. Excess sugar, drugs, anything that your body thinks shouldn't be here. In fact, even medicines you take, your body doesn't know you put it in your mouth deliberately, so your body will take the medicine out of the blood, and that's why you have to keep taking painkillers, because the effect wears off. Once the liver has done its quality control, blood, which as far as the liver is concerned, has got everything it needs and nothing it shouldn't have, that goes back into the general circulation via the hepatic vein. Now, let's have a look and see what does the liver actually do. First of all, it stores some amino acids, some proteins, some vitamins, some fats, it stores glucose, excess glucose, if your body, if you've taken in something, something that has a lot of sugar. It detoxifies, which means it takes anything poisonous out of the food. It filters the blood. And of course, it also produces bile. So basically, your liver is checking to make sure that what goes to your cells is just right. Then, the last part is the large intestine. And when food or the leftovers go into the large intestine, there's no food left. It's just water and waste. And as food passes through the large intestine, the water is reabsorbed, minerals are reabsorbed, and then in your small intestine are many bacteria and they help break down digested food. That's why when the feces come out, they have a delicate aroma. It forms feces in the rectum, and feces are in a semi-solid form, and then the feces get passed out of the anus during the process of egestion. 
And that's the journey of food through your digestive system. Bye.